Well, I really like um, to think that something positive can come out of this sort of dreadful period of um, plague and isolation that we're in. Um, most of us, but not all, I suppose, have been obliged to slow down and to stay in one place. And it has been, I think, has given us a degree of calm and time to savour every experience of our new restricted life and world. And, and for me, it's been a great pleasure to see the eruption of nature, from, you know, everything changing from day to day. And I think it's been really essential for me um, as part of my afternoon walk and, and to see this wonderful evolution and to appreciate it. Um, and also at this time, I've been very struck by the nature of the experiences that museums and galleries have offered me um, online. And they, a lot of them have um, chosen to focus our attention on an individual artist or a work of art. And you know, we've been invited to restrict our gaze. And I'm hoping that when all of this is over, that we won't have forgotten how rewarding this is, how, how much better it is than racing around an art gallery and trying to look everything or um, going to an art fair and being overwhelmed by thousands of works of art crammed into a tiny space. Um, and one of the reasons I founded Slow Art Workshop, SAW, in 2017 was to try and help people engage with works of art on a, um, on a sensory as well as sort of intellectual level. Uh, and it's all about the, the primacy of the object, the fact that these are, I mean, works of art are essentially objects, whatever they're made of, and that no image comes anywhere near replicating the experience of them, the, the potency and that physicality, and also our very visceral response to them. Um, and most works of art, as, as we know, sort of reveal their secrets slowly. So this is all about concentrating on one thing and looking and thinking um, and asking questions. But I think in our usual, very frenetic world, the most difficult thing is to, is to get into the state of mind that allows us to become receptive to music and to art. And, and in fact, um, I think that's one of the ways that your museum is so brilliant because it does this extraordinary thing of dissolving the clamour of everyday life. And so we have a kind of, you know, um, rinsing of the brain before we, we arrive. And so we are ready for the experiences that you offer. And I've always been intrigued by your inspiration for that. I mean, why did you decide to do that, Desiree? Well, I tell you, maybe I, I, I tell you a bit from how the thing started. When I was a child, I was a, a child who was uh, dreaming a lot. I mean, looking, looking in the wind, looking at leaves, looking at uh, trees, looking at farmers who turn the hay. Um, this was for me really a world which made me feel good. And Doing this, I think, since a child, I grew up uh, quite alone. Um, alone in a good way. Um, I, I, I liked this kind of um, being alone with myself. I love to go through the forest, for example, feeling the trees, um, feeling really the smell um, of the trees, and trying to capture really the essence of a tree and it was not only the tree it have been really uh, but let's say in nature or, or watching a deer how the deer moves when i saw one in the forest it made me very happy and you feel the 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 delicacy of how they move and how they eat and um, all that really i think uh, started early and impressed me and i went further then um, um, after I went to New York, New York was very important for me. I, for example, I went to the Metropolitan Museum 
every weekend, um, looked at only one, two, three pieces which have been important for me and looked very long. Then I went through Central Park to digest it and see the normal life, sometimes stopped in a bench and thought what I have seen and looked again, dreaming in the world of today. And then I finished normally. This was my personal exercise in the MoMA, Museum of Modern Art. And again, have been choosing a work, what was important to me, and looked very long at it. So I think through, through this, this I really educated uh, uh, maybe a specific sensitivity, looking and trying to capture the soul. I gave one year ago um, um, a lecture in, in Hong Kong University, and um, I spoke about how to show the soul of an artwork. And I think it is very important that people um, look really what is the essence of the art, what is really what makes the art piece important. And you can really even, I would go so far, you can connect with the person, the creator of this artwork because you really get it. And I think you, 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 you could become a friend even with a person who is hundreds of years, you know, not here anymore, or is here, you know, I mean, whatever, a contemporary piece. And this was, um, this I developed really more and more. Uh, for example, when I started um, with, with the Chuck musicians many years ago, I went to, to Chiida, the, the sculptor Eduardo Chiida, and um, I proposed him an exhibition with uh, the him with uh, Luras works uh, works on paper and terracottas by him, with um, Ming and Song Dynasty neck cushions, right. and he looked very astonished to me and he said, "How you know? I was always interested in that. I said I had no idea, but I feel." You have something in common very much with that. There is a feeling, and it was exactly what I mentioned before. I think you can capture things, who, whatever it is, a contemporary piece, or it is hundreds of thousands of years ago, was, has, been, has been created. And that was, for me, so interesting. Later on, for example, also in, in, in Van Chi's work, uh, an artist I like very much, Tsing Van Zhe, he is somebody who's very much in nature. He looks very long, and especially the works on paper, which um, he captures really uh, what, what is the essence. And this comes in fact from Song Dynasty. In Song Dynasty, it was extraordinary. You could look at a work done in the eighth century and you have never seen a fish and you feel what is a fish what what is a fish and that's not so not so easy this is incredible that people could be could have been able to to show that or what is a deer or what is you know i have never seen anything better than that so um i think there are some artists i mean i mentioned art saint van Gieu because he is not a person he's not a mass artist but today art so many art is produced for the market and i think it's something it's something at the end it goes against the artist that's what i think and i think it is very important and for me it's very important that a piece is really unique unique and you feel you feel it was done really um with a soul behind and not for not 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 just for the market um so I, I, I'm, I am watching since many years, you know, things uh, critically and all the masses who go to these huge uh, blockbuster exhibitions in museums. And exactly now this will not be anymore, I guess, after the, this corona crisis. I think people are rethinking and I think it is, um, it is really, it's really important. It is important to go back to the essence of life, also to, you know, that, that also children, for example, know where the milk comes from. They see that a tomato is not grown within 10 days in a glass house. 
it normally grows slowly and you see another color. It's really red and it tastes different. And these kind of things, it's not so normal, I think. You have to experience it. And I, 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 I spoke now, you know, about a, a global view, how, how, I, how I see the world. I think it's important to, to yeah, to be, again, more sensitive. We have to learn again, or most people have to learn again to look more and follow the instinct and feel more instead of only listening to what medias tell them. No, to think yourself, to have your own thinking and your own eye to discover and trying to get the essence. I think this is healthy, very healthy and important. And what you do, Susan, I mean, I, I, I like the word um, um, slow art because it's really exactly, it's exactly um, what is important. And it's nice that, that, to hear that somebody like you speaks about it. because certain things we all know, but nobody mentions it. And things have to be talked about. Uh, Susan, okay. <laughs> well, I think one of the privileges of my professional life has been that I have been able to, um, I've been able to look at works of arts of all periods, all cultures, um, and all you know different media, and I've been able to in um, in dealers' galleries. I've been able to or collectors' homes. I've been able to pick things up. I've you know I can have a feel the weight of a you know a Cycladic idol in the palm of my hand or a feather light Song Dynasty porcelain bowl or I've been able to go to a conservation lab and talk to the conservator about what I'm looking at and um, what they're doing and all of these things have enriched the you know my experience of my relationship with art and so the whole idea of the workshops was to offer anybody curious that sort of um, experience if you like and that opportunity of having a very intimate um, relationship where you're really holding feeling textures the smell the the weight all of these things which which is lost to us when you see things behind glass and i think um um and it that these are sort of uh, you know informal master classes if you like um because two things really worry worry me now i think that the power of contemporary art has become so great in, in, in our culture that people would not be, I mean, could easily be for, forgiven to thinking that there is nothing else that matters. There's nothing else out there. And so there are all sorts of kinds of works of art, which I feel people aren't looking at because they don't know they're there or not, or are not reminded of their existence. And this makes me terrifically sad. Um, and, and I think particularly with, um, you know, what you can call applied arts, sculpture, or three dimensional things, because flat art has won at the moment, really, and nobody really thinks much about anything else. And I also feel, um, I also feel that um, um, I'm really worried about this sort of idea of connoisseurship not being passed on that there's this sort of expertise um, and uh, of how to look at art how to experience it because in in academic art history this has become simply just about considering a work of art as a historical document and it's not about the thing itself um, and i think you're talking about the museum and what happens next is very interesting because the model of funding for most is predicated on these blockbuster exhibitions, which are not going to be possible now because of in a in a um, if you've got to have sell X number of tickets and you're not a, a able to allow very many people in. This is a very different um, 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 dynamic when it comes to presenting work to the public. And I think this is an opportunity to rethink it because I think so much of um, the museum experience and, and you, what museums think that they're all about has changed in recent decades. And then certainly in the UK, um, funding 
has been made available to them because they are educational resources. But I think we should actually think about their other role. I mean, this, they are not just, um, works of art are not there to educate us. They are there for pleasure. They're there for us to experience and to be taken out of our lives, to be taken to another place. And I think that this, I think you should, um, we should, almost as you, you as you said we need to learn how to do these things that we've almost lost um by our instincts to do we should learn to experience something and then we can begin to learn about it and they are sort of different things and i think that experience that opportunity to really allow a work of art to speak to us is something that um needs to be developed and it's a rather sad that we can't just walk up to something and respond to it and and it's partly to do with the fact that we think we ought to be improved by learning about these things but it's also that we um the clamor of everyday life makes it very difficult for our brains to sort of engage in a calm way and and i think in, um, in, the, in this new world, there may be more opportunities for that, and I really hope so. I agree with you, absolutely. Um, and I think that um, with all of these things, that there, it's, um, you know, with the, with the workshops, it's really a concept, it's, it's very simple. All you need is, um, you know, a work of art or a small group of works of art and a small group of people. I mean, it's actually not very complicated to do. This isn't, doesn't involve, um, you know, any great sort of complex infrastructure. It's just very, very simple. It's almost like going back to basics. Well, the workshops um, are really, um, came together for all sorts of different reasons. I thought, um, that it was a shame that people didn't um, really have the experience, the opportunity to handle works of art, to get very close to them without the glass, um, without um, standing a, a meter away. Um, and so I basically um, thought it would be a really nice idea to be able to have an informal um, a, a, a place that we could just have a small group of people who could look at a, a, you know one or two things and have somebody there who knew um, what we were looking at and so would give a like normally it's like a small introduction um, um, well I tell you the first the, the first um, the first workshop I arranged and I've I've for all of them um, have benefited from the generosity of friends in museums and in the art trade who have given their time and their collections for these purposes. And the first one I did was in the British Museum Reading Room, which was, um, sorry, the British Museum Prints and Drawings Reading Room. And it was fantastic. And um, Hugo Chapman got out and Isabel Seligman got out a group of drawings and prints from Leonardo to contemporary and um, appropriate to this theme um, they looked at um, they selected drawings and prints where the artist had consciously sought to slow down the visual perception of their work so this could be done by tremendous detail or it could be done by making a very complicated image which was very hard to read so you really had to look at it um, to really get a sense of what was going on and and it was absolutely amazing so we had um, Rembrandt we had Leonardo we had just about everybody you could possibly hope to see and the drawings and prints were in there out and they were in their matte frames but there was no glass and we were given um, magnifying glasses and we just spent the evening after it was closed to the public for an hour with our magnifying glasses looking at these amazing masterpieces. And it was just 
um, the most overwhelmingly wonderful experience because the setting was also very dramatic too. And it was a sense, everyone was excited by this. No one had seen drawings who, who um, that weren't behind glass before, who had not been you know, used to going to these um, museum print rooms. And the second one I did was um, in a dealer's gallery, which was um, the, um, the, the late lamented Oliver Hoare had this exhibition of works of art um, um, sort of around the Indus Valley, all sorts of different things actually. And we had a professor for Bo Paracci, who was a great expert on this, and he came and he got things done and passed them around. And it was just, um, uh, just, just absolutely a very special thing. And you could, yeah, and I think when you're, when there's a public lecture, very few people want to stand up and ask a question. And these are just very informal events where, um, if possible, and sometimes with gloves, sometimes without gloves, you can actually hold an object and, and you know, ha have it actually in your face and then turn to the, somebody and say, but why is it so light? You know, why did the artist do this? Why? And, and it's just, um, and it was very interesting because everybody would sort of join in and all the experts said that there were really interesting questions um, that made them think about things too in a slightly different way so that i think that it's a wonderful it's a wonderful formula i mean it, it's just a concept it just um anybody can do it anywhere um and it takes very little organization it just takes cooperation really and making the use of of the you know, expertise that's out there. And after all, they are, you know, these are public museums, they're there for us. And it's been also very interesting, those, those museums where they were happy to do it and um, free, um, because that's the other thing, I, I don't charge for these events. And then other, other institutions um, do comparable things, but they see them as a revenue stream and they don't want anybody offering anything um, for nothing, and I found that very sad. But uh, but we've done these workshops now in museums and galleries in London and Oxford and Cambridge, and they can be done at a, you know anywhere where people um, people are willing to do it. I think it's very nice. Also, you see the the enthusiasm, you know, of people and the passion. You know, I mean, in a small group, I think it's it, that that's actually nice. You know, when you see really you you are with an artist or you are directly with with an with an artist and, and in a small group, and somebody explains something about it in a nice way, not not too many words. I'm against too many words that people still can really look and feel it but maybe some essential things and then let the people you sometimes certain people need really an introduction and i think it is it is it is good so really to create really an appetite also you know to know more yes. and maybe i think that's that's uh, that's very that's very good you know you have sometimes to to provoke something yeah that something good comes out well, i think very few people um can actually walk up to something and immediately get it. And I think some, it's so helpful to have a way in and the more you look, and it's not that you have to be guided, it's not that you have to be told what to think, but it, it sort of helps and it helps you to ask yourself questions about what you're looking at and you know, what your response is. And I think that this is, this is what makes it very special. And I, I've just certainly, found that with, as I say, with my professional life, where you might look at something and think, well, it doesn't seem very exciting to me. And then and the more you, you know about it, and then you, the subtlety sort of reveals itself. And as you know, so much in your museum is after all Asian art, and a lot of this is tremendously subtle. And these things can often be, um, we talked earlier about, um, uh, you know, some porcelain. I mean, this looks so simple. It's so deceptive because it isn't simple at all. And the philosophy behind it is also incredibly sophisticated. And it doesn't make an object more beautiful for that reason, but they just happen to be incredibly pleasing and incredibly tactile. I mean, I think that's also very interesting um, that these were objects that were made to be used and made to be looked at.
and I think that having uh, things of such harmony and balance in our lives can only improve them and um, um, the way we think about the, the objects that we live with and what we don't really need to live with but do. Um, so. Absolutely. I mean, what, what I like very much when, when I see the, 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 the people, uh, our visitors are very young. Really, we have a very, very young um, crowd of visitors, which makes me very happy. Mm -hmm. And many of them you see, you know, they say, wow, look at that, how cool, how cool that is. They look at the form, it attracts them. And that's what I want, that the pieces seduce the visitors. Mm -hmm. And Okay, it's not so important that this piece is maybe an extremely rare uh, piece. Um, this is secondary to me. Um, important is that the piece really grabs the people and the atmosphere mm. is the atmosphere that the people are really seduced from the atmosphere, that they look and start feeling something without so many words. And uh, yeah, I think this is something which um, yeah makes me very happy because you never know when you start something, how will be the result. And seeing this now, um, I really think it's uh, it's um, uh, it's it works. It works exactly what what I what I was hoping that people who have not the the the, the knowledge before getting in something. And this was um, what I was hoping to achieve, how we installed it and how I made the lightning and, uh, you know, also meters of nothing that you are free in your head, in your eye to see the next. And uh, yes, I think it's, it's, um, it's uh, not easy for, for big museums, but when I would be in charge of, <laughs> Uh, a state museum, I think I could change uh, certain things which would be to their good. And I would, I would love to do that, the person never asked. So. <laughs> well, you never know, you never know. Well, in fact, it's very interesting that, um, when you talk about what you've done with your museum, because I remember when I was a student and I would go to the V&A a lot, the Victoria and Albert Museum in London, and I would go to the library um often as well for my you know um and i would walk through these galleries and i pass display case after display case and i think how can am i not stopped in my tracks every other step because when i did stop there would be something so stupendously wonderful so amazing and I thought, how have they managed to make all of this material so walkable, passable, if you see what I mean? How does the general public just walk past this? Because we should be stopped in our tracks because these pieces are amazing. And it's because everything is on top of each other that as soon as you try and look at one thing, you're aware of the 25 pieces around it. And of course, it is something you know that as a private museum you can do as you please and you have but i think that museums and in fact to be fair on the vna they have changed recently and they have taken a lot of material from those displays but i think the wonder and awe of art is lost in so many museums because of having too much in it and also too many people and the combination of too many things and too many people um, is a disaster really but equally we'd be furious if all the work was taken out and we couldn't see it so i don't really know what the answer is but i think you your museum shows that it is so important to offer um in the mainstream museum an opportunity to look at art this way as well as the traditional way if you like and i've um i've argued before and i will continue to argue why not have a space in a big museum where you have an appropriate atmosphere that's darkened room, a chair for heaven's sake, so you could actually look at something carefully in a way that was conducive to 
really engaging with it as opposed to just walking past. Um, Absolutely. I mean, what, what I what I want to say it before it's um, you know when I, I do it as a as a self discipline so uh, something I, I go through let's say the, the the Prado and I just walk 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 and I let me stop from the art pieces and I do this in many places and sometimes even there is a famous one it does not stop me. You know, and people say, you know, and when you go with the guide sometime, you know, that the person says, but this is, and I don't agree. I don't agree because it's a famous artist. Why? I don't agree. And maybe I find something else. Somebody is, is not that known, but is an absolute overseen master. You know, and sometimes the time regulates it. I mean, there are, there are artists, you know, who are just hundreds of years afterwards really um, seen how important they have been and um, but I think that that's that's interesting for me to let me st I mean that the pieces stop me you know yeah. and um, yeah it's uh, it's I, 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 I enjoy doing this I do it many times well I, th I, I mean I think it's extraordinary how people have been brainwashed into thinking that they have to look at these masterpieces which they tick off on their tours around the world. I mean, the Mona Lisa must be the most boring painting you know, in, in the Louvre. And yet this is the only thing that most people want to go and see. And even then they don't really look at it. They just take selfies um, in front of it. So, and you're in this, um, well, an amazing gallery of pictures which are so much better, so much more interesting to look at. And people, just won't give themselves the opportunity. I often think that most people in galleries look at it as an ordeal. You look at their faces, they are not having a good time. You know, they're miserable because they feel they've got to do the museum. I think people should be told, no, you don't have to do a museum. You just go there and you have fun. You enjoy yourself. You stay, you look at one thing, you stay 15 minutes. That's fine. You don't have to look at everything. And I think, Think that well, it's I more a fun fair park today, you know. I mean, you know, I was I was uh, a while ago in, in New York in, in the MoMA in a in the big exhibition, and I, I had to leave. I tell you, I had to leave because I couldn't see the works anymore. The same happened to me in in, in, in Paris in a, in a fantastic exhibition, but I could not see the works really anymore. And the pe people, the funny thing is. A lot of people didn't even look, they just wanted to be there because it was a hot spot to be there, you know, and you can say I have been there in this exhibition and they made mainly photos and uh, um, talking and, and, you know, it was uh, like you go in a park, so, you know, and you speak to each other or <laughs> a fun fair park um, and um, sometimes I think, you know, this is, this is not good. This is, and, and this for sure, that's the good thing, you know, I mean, the, what, what, what maybe comes out of this crisis that people really change and are more sensitive afterwards. You know, many people, I think, you know, they, are, they, they, they think about more what is, what is, what are the values? What is important for my life? What was, you know, what was in this time, you know, the, the essence, but what I get out of it for me and my life. And I think that's, that's, uh, that's good. Well, let's hope it does have that effect. I mean, it, I, I have an awful- <laughs> You're right, all back to the same machinery. <laughs> you are right. Everybody will go back you are right. to the crazy life that we had before. I'm hoping that this will not be and that people will have the chance to reflect on, on the tremendous kindness of strangers, of the natural world as we see it, of the fact that, you know, we are here for a finite time and we better enjoy ourselves and we better make the most, you know, carpe diem. Yeah, I like that. In, in German, yeah? I like that what you said. Yeah. Enjoy ourselves. I think it's important to enjoy in general. You know, it can be a crispy bread when you like bread. It can be, uh, it can be an apple. It can be the simple things, but celebrating them. Yes. Enjoying them and trying to have good quality of this little thing and not just the thing. To have yes. the best when you can get it. And yes. in simple things, it is possible to get the best. You know, you don't need 
10. This is the example of what I like and what I learned in Japan. In Japan, when you go to a store, a good fruit store, for example, you, you, you are amazed about the quality. You're also amazed about the prices. But the quality is so amazing that instead of having buying 50 strawberries, you eat nine. But this nine, every single strawberry or every single melon or everything, I mean, everything is so delicious that you're all, uh, whatever, a, a small piece of meat or, or fish. And this, I think, is nice to learn also, to appreciate quality and enjoy it, really deeply enjoy it in food and in art and in, in little things, the view to a beautiful landscape, um, enjoying, enjoying. That's important, you know, and, and to, to know how to enjoy, deeply enjoy, take it in, inside you. Breathe it, you know, and, and yeah, uh, yeah but, but feel, be happy. Be happy. And once again, this idea of, you know, quality rather than quantity. It's, it's as you say, the nine strawberries rather than the box of strawberries. And it's the same with art. It's the same with any, anything. You want the quality. You want to look at something that's wonderful and um, savour it save all of these experiences and um and i hope we will learn that this is better to do this and and to to clear our minds a little i mean i talked to a friend who um um about the situation with music for example about going to a concert in the early evening where everybody nobody's eaten their blood sugar is low and also for the audience and even even really quite shockingly for the musicians themselves it's very hard for them to get into the zone to sort of at 6 30 to start playing mala or something it is not something you can switch on and switch off it is very very hard and so we all in a way need to to um, make it easier for ourselves to experience everything. Um, it's all there, we're so spoiled. We have everything available in so many different forms. Um, uh, but as, as, you, as you talk about it, maybe people will see this think later. You know, you always, I think it's nice you at least keep a little, but sometimes this little is enough already that it changes your life. You know, you need sometimes, you know, you hear something, you think this is true, and maybe this is then later adjusted to your daily life and helps you. Or not. I mean, it, it's everybody's choice anyway. It's everybody's choice, I think. But it's, a, it's an alternative. It's, it's a possibility. And I think a lot of people don't even consider it as a possibility. Um, because uh, everybody s sort of equates success um, with movement, with a movement forward. And in fact, I think this is a period of sort of stasis. And I think this is a period of, um, of if people aren't too worried, uh, you know, it's a period of, of calm and tranquility. And I think a lot of people are thinking, Worried. Worried is a good word you've said now. I think people are too worried lately. Yeah. I well, think people are always worried. You know, they're, they're worried and, 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 and exactly. The word worried is a good one. Or anxiety. Worried many times. You know, too, too, too worried. I don't know. There, there are always so many worries. Mm. Um, and I think as life gets more complicated, the worries just um, multiply. I think. Um, that is the great um, point of simplicity in a way that um, um, that you think about the things that really matter and um, an, an, an instinct and responsiveness to every situation. Um,